Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Door to Door. I'm Virginia Stanley, joined by my trusty colleague, Lainey Mays. Hi, Lainey. How are you? Good. Uh, we are thrilled to have these two megawatt authors, megawatt humans, Ann Patchett and Elizabeth McCracken here today to talk about writing, to talk about books, to talk about friendship, to talk about Ann Patchett's forthcoming book, These Precious Days, an essay collection that will um, that will set your, your heart aflutter. It's, it turns um, hilarious, insightful, powerful, heartbreaking, tender. Um, and Elizabeth, thank you both so much for coming on today. Thank you. Well, it's such a pleasure. Well, it's, I think this is one of the biggest buildups we've had to all of our door-to-door -door episodes. We have librarians have been um, jumping at the bit for this. And so we're going to get right to it and do a quick intro with both of you. And then I'm going to just sort of, we're just going to have a conversation. Librarians, write in your questions and uh, we'll get to it. So um, Anne Patchett, the author of eight novels, including The Patron Saint of Liars, Taft, The Magician's Assistant, Bel Canto, Run, State of Wonder, Commonwealth, and The Dutch House. Four works of nonfiction, including This is the Story of a Happy Marriage and Two Children's Books, The Scapegoat and Lamb Slide, Love. Um, your books have been New York Times uh, Notable Books, New York Times Bestsellers, finalists for the Pulitzer, and you've won numerous prizes, including the Ped Faulkner and the Orange Prize for Fiction. Um, you are the co-owner of Parnassus Books in Nashville, in Tennessee, and uh, your new book, These Precious Days, which is um, an absolutely beautiful, beautiful from cover to cover, literally, uh, will uh, is a, a collection of essays that um, you peel back the layers and you share your life with us from childhood and personal and work and writing. Your entire life is, is woven throughout the pages of these books and we can't wait to talk to you about it. So thank you so much for this book. Um, yes. And Elizabeth, Elizabeth McCracken, author of seven books, including The Souvenir Museum, which uh, came out last year and will be in paperback in January of 2022. Rave reviews, Kirkus and PW both gave starred reviews, such raves for this book. Um, it is, it is heartwarming and funny, dark and light. And I don't know how you do that, but I love that you do. Uh, your books, uh, Bowl Away, Thunderstruck and Other Stories, which was the winner of the 2014 Story Prize, long listed for the National Book Award and the Giant's House National Book Award finalist. Uh, your stories have appeared in Best American Short Stories. You won three Pushcart Prizes, a National Magazine Award and an O. Henry Prize. Uh, you live in Texas with your family and you are made it made it so clear to us today. You're here for Anne, and uh, you have a <laughs> you just want to share the love. And you know this is an exciting book, as are your books. And we look forward to the paperback, um, and we look forward to talking about Anne's new book. And so I welcome you both, and I thank you so much for coming on, um, just to talk uh, to talk books, to talk writing, to talk friendship. Here we go. How are you? Oh my gosh, Anne. I'm so excited. And thank you, Virginia. And thank you, Lainey. I really appreciate you getting us to do this. The wonder of Zoom. And hello, librarians. Thank you for keeping society alive during the pandemic. We appreciate that. It's so funny. On Zoom, I can't pretend that I'm talking to anybody but the literal people I see. It's very That's really all the chair. It's so nice being in my, I'm sitting in my dining room talking to you and this is such a magnificent book. And I feel like I, you know, for, for literal decades now, for three literal decades now, um, I've, we've exchanged work and I've read your work and I feel like there was a certain period of time where I would always say, oh, this is the best thing you've ever written. And you now have written so many books that are all the best things that you've ever written um, <laughs> that it's become nonsensical. I love this book so much. I feel like it is, this is my first question. One of the many things that I was tremendously moved by in the book, and it is, as Virginia says, it's funny, it's, it's um, various, 
And it really feels like it's about the passage of time. Um, the, the, the title feels like it's about that. And one of the things that's really compelling about it is that it's about the passage of time at different speeds at different times in your life. Mm -hmm. And so that's my first question is, it's a book um, that talks about the pandemic, but has so many different time frames in it. And I wonder but how you, how you think about time these days and also how you think about writing about time because some of these essays are just, you know, magnificent. That's the word I used before, but astonishing in how they collapse and deal with time and weave it back and forth. So how long have we been friends? Since 88? No, since 90. 90, okay. So since, since 90, I feel like you and I have been having a conversation about time since 1990 and that we are both obsessed with time and how you write about it. I mean, and maybe this is the difference. Like I've always been obsessed with time as a writer. And now I think at 57, I'm becoming obsessed with time as a human <laughs> as well. And maybe those two things are finally colliding. Um, but yeah, how do you how do you move over a long period of time without boring the reader to death? And how do you know how to just drop down and speak very specifically about a moment and then pull back for years, right? And and then drop down again or to skip back and forth. I've always been a big fan of linear time. You know, begin at eight o'clock in the morning, end at eight o'clock at night. And uh, certainly with Commonwealth and the Dutch House, I started to have to spin back and forth in time because I was covering so much time. Those books both take place over 40 or 50 years. Um, and, and the more you do it, the better you get at it. So with the essays, this book was my pandemic project. I wrote most of these essays during the pandemic um, when fiction was not making any sense to me as a writer. I was still reading fiction, but I just couldn't write it. And there were a lot of things I wanted to write about in nonfiction. I was so grateful for this book. Like you can be grateful for a, a really good jigsaw puzzle or a sweater that you're knitting or something. It's like, oh God, I'm so glad that I have this to work on. Um, but the title essay, which was about my friend Suki Raphael, who came and lived with us for the first part of the pandemic. Um, and she had recurrent pancreatic cancer. And I had, a, I was overwhelmed by a sense of time, you know, that, that these precious days, we were hopeful. We were hopeful that this, this clinical trial she was going to be in was gonna buy her more time. That's what it's about. Can you buy more time? And in the process of trying to buy time, how are you gonna spend your time? And, and more than anything, she really was a stranger to me and my husband when she came, we had a little fond email exchange, but we didn't really know each other. And then she got sort of pandemically shipwrecked with us for several months. And one of the things that Carl and I used to say to each other constantly when we would get into bed at night can you believe she's with us? Like of all the people in the world who would do anything to have her stuck in their house, her children, her husband, her sisters, her mother, her legions of best, close, dearest friends who she would sit down and Zoom with every night after dinner. But she was with us and, and we got this time and and then of course you're in a pandemic. So, you know, you're thinking about everybody's time. So the longest possible answer to your question, uh, definitely this is a book that was about time. And, and, you know, you get to a point in your life or in your pandemic or in your aging process that you do suddenly internalize what you always know intellectually, it's not gonna last forever. Um, but wow, it is really not going to last forever. And so 
how do you just keep your eyes open and be grateful? Yeah, it's, I mean, that essay is incredible. And, and you say in, the, in your introduction to the book um, that you wrote it and then you wrote the rest of the book sort of as a shelter. I mean, the rest of the essays as a shelter for it. And I'm, I'm so interested in writing about somebody who you are living with and that you make, which is one of the things that big essay is about, is a, about what happens when you become friends with a writer and also what it means when a writer is going through a life-changing experience and writing. Yeah, and I mean, I knew pretty early on that I was going to write about Suki and she was such a private person. And, and I didn't know how to talk to her about it. And um, the, gosh, I am really good, as you know, of saying, okay, now we're gonna talk about that hard thing that nobody wants to talk about. And I couldn't do it. And, and I was making notes and, and I wasn't thinking, oh, wow, you know, I wanna write this and I wanna publish it. I really was just thinking, I'm gonna have to write about this, even if no one ever sees it. I'm gonna take a quick little dog leg Years and years ago, Liz Gilbert let me read this essay that she wrote about her neighbors. It was the most amazing piece of writing. And I said, what are you gonna do with it? She said, I'm not gonna do anything with it because if I ever publish this, I won't have any friends anymore in my neighborhood. I, I can never publish this. And I said, but you, you wrote it, it it's, it, it's astonishing. And she said, yeah, I needed to write it. I didn't need to publish it. And that was really helpful when I was thinking about Suki in those early days. I thought, I don't need to publish this, but I need to write it because it's the only way I'm gonna make sense of it. So it, she had been here a while and her computer died and um, she was very, very financially strapped because she had really good health insurance but it doesn't make any difference if you have really good health insurance when you have pandemic, uh, pancreatic cancer, pandemic cancer, um, because there are deductibles and she was involved in um, treatments and protocols that weren't covered by insurance. And she really was losing everything. You know, they, she cleaned out their retirement accounts and it, it was a terrible situation anyway. And she didn't want to take anything from me and her computer broke, which She's Zooming, she's still working her whole life, everything. I mean, her life raft is this computer that links her to the world. She is trapped in my house. And I kept saying, you're gonna have to let me buy you a computer. And she couldn't, she just was like, no, 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 no. You've done too much. I can't let you do that. Awful conversation, back and forth, back and forth. And we were sitting on the couch about 10 feet away from where I am now. And I finally said, listen, I'm going to write about you. So you have to let me buy this computer. <laughs> like, it, was the, it was this moment where I just thought, okay, she needed to feel like she was giving me something in return. She just kept saying, I cannot take one more thing from you. And I was like, all right, all right, I'm going to write about you. And, um, and I said all along, I'm gonna ask you questions, I'm gonna take notes, uh, I'm gonna write this, I'm gonna give it to you. And it's fine if no one ever sees it but the two of us, that is so fine. Anything you wanna change, you can change. Anything you want me to add, subtract, or we can throw it away, it's fine. I just have to do this. And um, one of the, I mean, not one of the like, very best things about this is it was so meaningful to her to have this essay. And I know she read it easily 50 times. Mm -hmm. She just read it over and over again because it was like, it was like giving a mirror to a beautiful woman who had never seen her own face. Like she had no idea. And she then gave it to all of her friends and all of her family. And they all said, yes, of course, that's exactly who you are. That's exactly how we see you. 
And she was like, no, no, I'm nothing. I'm not. Is this really, is this me? Is this really me? This is really what you think of me? And, and it allowed her, especially with her kids, to have conversations, you know, the hard conversations about dying that nobody seemed to know how to start, but they could talk about them through talking about the essay. And it just got better. And I mean, after I finished it, it just took on this life in her family and got better and better. And then it was published. And then everybody in the world seemed to know. And all of these old friends got back in touch with her. Like the guys on the ship, Christmas, the tall ship that she ran off and got on that ship, they showed up. I mean, a week before she died, they found the essay. And, and they called me and called her, oh my God, you know, it was just a gift. It was amazing. Oh, that's so beautiful. Um, so can I, and let me just say, so when people talk about, oh, it's a bad thing to write about people who are alive or it's a bad thing, it's a painful thing, it's an invasive thing, you shouldn't write about people, you know, and I'm like, but man, it can also be just the opposite too. Yeah. Can, can we talk about the essays around that essay? It's the, the centerpiece and the cover of the book is um, a painting of Sookie's um, and is beautiful. One of the things, well, first of all, I, at one point I asked you when I was reading it, uh, I said, I'm, I'm skipping around. Is that all right? Do you care? And you said, Yes, it was actually an email, but I heard the tone. I think I think you said like, "Don't you care?" Of course, I care. What order? But these these essays in an order for a reason, and I I obeyed and and read it straight through. Um, and one of the things that's really beautiful about the book is that there are long essays like that that feel like that feel several of them that feel like they could have been written with that decision to. I'm going to write this. I don't know whether I'm going to publish it. Yeah. That feel sort of turned, turned to you and the material. And then there are essays that are very, very clearly and announce what they're written for. And so there are occasional pieces and long personal pieces. Um, and I just love to know how you, how you put the book together and what you decided went into it and what didn't. And they all, they all fit together beautifully. It's very, it's sort of, it's almost symphonic, you know, that there are, there are different, um, different essays have different tones and music to them. And you're glad for the ones that feel different from each other. Thank you. Um, you know, one of the things that I realized when I was putting together Happy Marriage, that in my life, I had never written a piece of nonfiction that wasn't for something. Hmm. Like there was nothing in Happy Marriage that hadn't been commissioned. And, and yet most of the pieces in this book, I just wrote because I was home and in a pandemic and, and thinking about an essay book, but I, I wanted to write pieces that were really long. I wasn't thinking about publishing, but a lot of how the book came together is that I, I went through the stacks, I found essays that I had, I, I found the essays obviously that I had written this year, I put the book together and then I would show it to somebody and I would say, tell me what the weak sister is. Tell me, you know, read this book and say, if you could take one essay out, which one would it be? And, and nobody will tell you more than one. Right, people. Nobody is going to read the book and say these are the three that should go. Everybody's you know? like, "Oh, I love the book, but this one should go." And then you take it to the next person. You take that one out, and you're like, "Okay, which one should go? Oh, this one should go." And it it all really had the ring of truth. So I was also writing to fill out, you know, because things would come out, and obviously the ones that came out were older ones or ones that had been written very specifically for a purpose. And one of the very last people to read the book was my editor, Jonathan Burnham. And he called and he was, he's such a kind guy. And he was like, ah, oh, there's, there's one essay I don't, I mean, I love it. It's so good. 
it just, mm, maybe it just really shouldn't be in the book. And it was a profile that I had written of Reese Witherspoon for Vanity Fair, which was a really long piece and a piece that I really liked because she just turned out to be such an incredibly interesting person and, and what she has done right, for women um, in the arts. And she's really reshaped an entire industry. I found it fascinating. And she's from Nashville and, you know, it was, it was a great celebrity profile. And, yeah, it was. <laughs> and Jonathan said, it's a great celebrity profile but it's still a celebrity profile. And I, and I think it's the weak sister. I had taken all the other weak sisters out before, before that. And so then that left a really big hole in the book. Um, and I thought, okay, all right, what can I write a long essay about? And the one, there were, there were two actually long essays that I wound up writing very late. One was, there are no children here. And, and that's, that was really funny because for as long as I have been writing nonfiction, people have been asking me to write a piece about not having children. And I always think, oh, it's so boring. Like, who cares why I don't have children? I never have written about that. Not because I feel like it's this big personal thing. I just think I don't have kids. So what? You make a wonderful appearance in that essay. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, and as you know because we were we were young together you know we were in our 20s and sitting in bars talking about the fact that we probably would never have children uh, and then you introduced this insane idea in which you said to me well you know if I ever met somebody who desperately wanted children with me and would be an amazing father and I was like what <laughs> where is that person ever that person i mean i've never met that guy do you think that guy's out there and you did you met that guy you know just incredible and had these beautiful children and he's a great father and your great parents huh? i mean that was wild still to this day just it blows my mind um but that essay really wrote itself. Like, I, I swear I have no memory of even typing it. I wrote it so fast. And then the other essay that I wrote really, really late as a replacement essay was Flight Plan. Um, that and, so much. and that's also funny because that was an essay that was a super easy essay to write. Um, I had been wanting to write that for 10 years. And there had been so many times that I sat down and it's an essay for, for those who have not read this book um, about the fact that my husband, Carl is a pilot and he's a doctor, but he flies and he's always flown and he's always had a plane and kind of how that's impacted our relationship. But it really, it's, it's about marriage and just kind of dealing with the things that the person you love does that you aren't interested in yourself. Um, but every time, I had tried to write that and I had interviewed him. I had all these notes. I just kept thinking, oh, boo-hoo, Ann Patchett has an airplane and it makes her unhappy. <laughs> how, do you write a, how do you write an essay about what a drag it is to be married to somebody who owns a plane? Like, seriously? Um, if you looked up first world problems in the dictionary, I mean, that that wouldn't even be in there. It's, it's so gross, it's so obscene. So I had tried to stare that down before and I had just never gotten anywhere. And, and then finally, when I wrote it, I thought I'm, I can write this in such a way that no one is going to read it and think, ooh, I wish, I wish my husband had an airplane. <laughs> I love that essay so much. And, and one of the reasons is I love Carl in it so much. Um, and I don't, do you let Carl read the stuff that you write about him? Oh, sure. Sure. Do you? Really, it was a lot like Suki. Carl loved that essay. He loved seeing how I saw him 
And when it came out, he sent it to all of his friends. And it was so touching. Um, and then I, oh gosh, I can't remember. I was with somebody and they were saying, oh, Carl is so great. And I said, oh, I wrote a profile of him in the New Yorker. It's in this week. I wrote a profile of Carl. It's in the New Yorker this week. And everybody was like, oh my gosh, Carl's in the New Yorker. Oh, oh, okay, name drop. It was Yo-Yo Ma. It was <laughs> Yo-Yo Ma. I was with Goat Rodeo. They did a concert here and we were having dinner with them. And Yo-Yo came over and said, oh my gosh, Carl. Oh, I love talking. I love seeing Carl. It's so great to see Carl. And I said, you know, I have a profile of him in the New Yorker this week. Because I thought that's what it is. I mean, it really is a profile of Carl. It really is. I, yeah. And one of the things that you do that I can't get over is in fact, I don't, this seems like, I technically I too am a writer, but I cannot, the, the ability to write about somebody you know really well, who you're still living with, stymies me. And I just don't know how, do you ever, I don't even know what my question is. Like maybe I'm just like, I love that essay so much and it is such a, tender and full portrait of him. And it really, yeah, it really is a portrait. Yeah, well, you know, I really love him. And um, and the, the things that I love about him are very clear to me. Um, and Carl also is such a character. You know, I can think of other people who are perhaps more subtle than my husband. <laughs> You know, Carl is big. Carl really is, he's got a little movie star vibe to him that makes it easier to write about. Um, you know, he's he's getting off the he's getting off the plane and renting the boat to sail across the Atlantic and then accidentally gets the motorcycle that he has to take back. And you know the it's like shooting fish in a barrel. <laughs> They're still talking about the outfit he bought in Provincetown and walked around wearing. Tell us about that. <laughs> I yeah. still remember that outfit. I will never forget that outfit. Do you do you want to do you want to yeah. do it? Somebody, somebody tell us. If I if I can remember, it was that we were all in Provincetown. I can't remember that you and I were teaching or and he was alone and free during the day yes. shop and he went shopping and he bought this amazing like melon colored knit top not quite a, like the most glamorous polo shirt in the entire world and a pair of rather tight were they striped pants i know that they were multicolored. they were striped <laughs> drawstring drawstring and then thereafter he made so many friends that Anne and Carl would walk down Commercial Street in Provincetown and then be like, Carl, hey, Carl. And he looked great in those clothes, although maybe not quite like himself. Yes. So Carl is, I don't know if, it, if it's still culturally appropriate to reference old Woody Allen movies, but Carl really is Zelig. And you put him with any group of people and he fits in very nicely. So, you know, Carl was just a hot gay man in Provincetown. While we were busy teaching, he was off making friends. He's like glamour zealot. He's like, not like in the background. He's <laughs> first and, you know, he's there in the front of the picture. Yeah, that's right. When, that, when, when we were having dinner with the, with the goats of Goat Rodeo, and I was, I was sitting with Chris Steele and he said, you know, is it ever tricky when, when you guys go out and you get invited to a really cool party and you know, you're getting invited because of you, you know, does Carl ever feel sort of second tier? <laughs> I was like, no, because every single time we go to a party that I've been invited to, everybody likes so much more than they do me and they all line up at the door at the end of the night and you're like oh my god 
God, thank you. Thank you so much for bringing Carl. He's going to change my life. He's going to do this and that. And he really does. I mean, it's like the whole story about Sookie. I mentioned Sookie as we're walking the dog one night. Oh, I, you know, I have this sort of email friendship with somebody I don't really know. And she has recurrent pancreatic cancer and she can't get into a clinical trial. I mean, I was just talking and Carl was like, yeah, I'll take care of that. Have her send me her, her files in the morning and I'll get her into a clinical trial. And it, yeah. I would like to interject here to say that not only did I love that essay about Carl because my takeaway was not, oh, poor Ann Patch, it's got a husband, it's got a plane. My takeaway was, oh my God, she loves him so much. That's what I took away from that essay. That love that, that you had for each other was flowing off those pages. I'm not just saying that because you know we're publishing this book. I'm really not. That's, that's what I took from that. But I also underlined, among the many lines that I underlined in the galley, was um, in these precious days, the essay you wrote, simply put, Carl makes rain. I love that line. I love that line because going back to how Carl, you know, you mentioned it, you didn't even want to, but you did. You mentioned it. He, he asked you what was new that day or what was the news of the day, I think he said to you, and you told him what was going on and he made rain. And, yep. um, you know, you said he solves the problems that other people have tried and failed to solve for years. I mean, I was, I was, had the honor of meeting him once when we were in Seattle and he was so lovely. And I just think this is, um, this, this book is, um, I don't want to say a love letter, but I just feel like it's, it's uh, rife with, with, um, with, with uh, life lessons and, and looking back at your life and how you, you know, you cringe at the things that you wrote when you were younger, but then had the guts to look at those things and unpack those boxes and read those things and, and just, and then bringing Carl to the pages and what, how instrumental he was, but of course, how you were in, in um, taking Sookie's um, life and, and giving her permission in a way you really did. You gave her permission and to, to, um, to let the colors out, you know, and to, and to the point where she didn't want to leave you. At first she kept saying, I need to go home. And then it was like, no, I, I don't want to leave you. What, you. what a wonderful gift that you gave to her and she to you for sure. That's absolutely true. And, um, and that's really a question. There's not a right or a wrong answer to this, but I really kind of wish she hadn't left. And she, because she wished she hadn't left. Yeah. And, and even at the very end, we were talking about flying her back um, so she could die here uh, because she put so much of her energy into managing her disease and looking constantly for different treatments or potential cures or you know, just going, so many things fall through the cracks in healthcare and you have to be so vigilant that somebody's not giving you the wrong medication that when, when someone calls and says, no, don't come in for chemo today. Oh, wait, no, that was a mistake. Oh, wait, no, you, you should have come in. And that when she was here, Carl oversaw everything and she could really rest and be herself and make her art and spend her time being the person she wanted to be instead of being the person who was on hold with insurance companies four hours a day, these precious days, time. You know, what do you want to do with your time? Do you want to be on hold with an insurance company? Um, yeah. So uh, this is not connected and profoundly connected. Susan Orlean has a book coming out in October called On Animals which is so fantastic. And it's an essay collection of all the pieces that she's published in the New Yorker and the Smithsonian over the years that have to do with animals. All old, old pieces, pieces that have been in her other essay collections. And they're so fantastic and it's so much fun to read them all together. And somebody said to me, you know, down the road, you could have like a greatest hits book just called Carl. <laughs> Stories in which you just 
bring all of the crazy Carl stories together and just have a book called Carl. And I think, yeah, that, that would work. That would be good. I love it. I love it. And, and Elizabeth, I love what you said about just the way the essays, where they're placed. They are symphonic. I mean, I, you, there is no good place to put this book. There just is not a good place to stop. And it's not a novel, but it's these wonderful stories, life lessons, lessons learned by Anne imparting to us with humor and with eloquence. And they're just, they're delicious. They really are. And uh, I can't, uh, I can't speak highly enough about this book. And of course, of you as a human being, because you were wonderful. And can I, can I tell you an unrelated, I mean, a related, unrelated story about Kate DiCamillo? Oh, yeah. Because that was an essay that so many people, and again, you know, I'm a bookseller, so many people responded to that. And we had floods of people ordering her books. <laughs> After that piece came out in the New York Times, she got four of her old backlist titles on the Times list. Wow. That essay. And, um, and so I thought, oh, I really want to put it in the book. And then when I read it, it was just, it just wasn't enough. You know, it was like a 700 word essay. There was, and I didn't, I didn't know how to make it bigger or more. And I was talking to Kate about it. And she said, well, you should tell that story about the night that you finished Magician's Elephant and mom and family came back to see you. It, it's so weird. You know, I, I won't say that I had forgotten it, but in a way I had. And, and after it happened, I mean, I called her and told her and it was really early on in our friendship. And so then to go back and put that in and put in the long passages from Magician mm -hmm. Elephant that caused that story to happen and really completely and totally rewrite the essay. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, that's that was that was magical, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. I, I was, said that was that was magical. And yeah. I did, you know, you and uh, yeah, uh, everybody who reads this book is really in for such a treat. You're 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 enveloped in the story of Suki, and then within those bookends are the story of so many parts of life, so many different aspects of life, and 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 magical and and funny, and and you know, learning about your mom and your sister, and you, and the writers, the writers who affected, who had played such a role in both of your lives, in your life, and in, in Elizabeth McCracken's lives, and life and just that intersection of you know um i don't know just just writing and learning and and the iowa writers workshop and there's so much in here for anybody who loves books and loves writers and wants to know how all of this ticks and ah, it's just so it's so brave too really i mean you go back and you you know i don't want to spoil it for anybody but it's just every essay is um is a is a mini adventure can I ask one really persnickety question that I've been wondering about? Because after I obeyed you and I went back and read it in order, one of the things I loved is how one essay led to the next, whether it was one of the longer essays or there's an introduction to um, a volume of Eudora Welty. There's a short piece on, on Snoopy, which I, Snoopy as inspiration for your writing career, which I just loved. Did you tinker with the beginnings and endings to lead one essay to another? Because I found it, after I finished it, I wrote to you say, I just, I found those transition, transitions deeply pleasurable. Well, I certainly didn't write them. I mean, I arranged them in hopes that there would be a good transition. I didn't write anything so that one would lead to another. But, you know, the, the answer really is, it's me right? It's just my personality. It's my vision. Um, and so it's the things that I'm interested in. It's the way that I think. It's the way that I put things together. I, uh, everybody, when Suki was here, all my neighbors knew her. And of course, we weren't 
going anywhere. No one was going anywhere. So we would just walk up and down the street. It was a really beautiful spring full of freaky bad weather, but they all knew her. So when I came back from California, there's a, a guy who lives across the street from us who's an oncologist. And I told him that Sookie had died and we were talking about it. And, and after that, he read the, the essay, These Precious Days, and he said to me, how can you do that? How can you make yourself so vulnerable? How can you, how can you tell the truth like that? He said, I just wanted to look away at some point because you were just opening yourself up so much. How do you do that in writing? And I said, oh, Michael, that doesn't have anything to do with writing. That's who I am all the time. And I don't in any way, I don't read these essays and think, oh, wow, I'm just, you know, ripping my chest open so that people can see my heart. It's just that's, that's how I live all the time. It's beautiful. Lainey, what do you say? Do we have some questions for Elizabeth and Anne? We do. There's a lot of positive comments as well. And I think a lot of people are really appreciating how open and beautiful the conversation is about loss and, and giving the great memory of her. And they all were saying how much that, that meant to them, especially I think when everyone's in a season of loss this year. Um, and then, yeah, what best books I've read this year. I can't wait to put this on my uh, to be our to TBR list. Um, this is a good question for both of you. So Sylvia said, when's the first moment that you said to yourself, I am a writer? Elizabeth, you want to take it first? Sure, because it has to do with Alan Gerganis, you mentioned before, who was uh, Anne's teacher at Sarah Lawrence when she was an undergraduate and was my first workshop teacher uh, at gra in graduate school, the Iowa Writers Workshop. And Alan told us the first day of workshop that we were writers and that we should not spend any time thinking about it um, because it was a boring question. Um, and I do think that he, that, that that for me, and before that I was somebody who wrote, but then after that, I was a writer. Boy, that's so interesting because certainly even Early, early childhood, I wanted to be a writer. I was not a kid who said, I am a writer, but I was a kid who said, I want to be a writer. And I wrote all the time. That was, you know, I wanted to be a writer like Carl wanted to be a doctor. This was the thing that I was going to train for and practice for. And my, when I went to Sarah Lawrence, I, my first year I took a poetry class and I realized that I was a really bad poet. I had wanted to be a poet. And my second year I thought, okay, I always wanted to be a writer, but now I realize I can't be a poet. Um, and, and I know Elizabeth, you went through a lot of this. You should talk about this too. And then I landed in Alan's class, my sophomore year of college. So I had Alan at Sarah Lawrence and Elizabeth studied with him at Iowa. And it was like, oh, okay this is it, short stories, which I had never given a moment's thought to. So it wasn't that I thought at that moment, okay, now I am a writer, because I don't know when that happened, but it was now I know what I'm gonna write, what I'm gonna do. So talk about the poetry playwriting short story thing. Oh, I wrote, I, I wrote poetry and plays pretty serious. I mean, I was always a bad playwright, but I was a pretty good undergraduate poet and I really had my decision made because I applied in graduate school in both and got in, the only place I got funding was at Iowa. Um, but having Alan Gerganis as your first teacher was thinking that you might be interested in converting to Christianity and meeting Billy Sunday. He was just, probably reference doesn't make any sense anymore, but meeting <laughs> the most evangelical. He was just, he told us how lucky we were that we wanted to write fiction and that we wrote fiction, that no other calling could be greater. And I think I went, until I went to graduate school, you know, I, I worked in libraries from the time I was 15 until I was 22. I'm not sure I understood that being a writer was a job um, exactly. And I was always gonna go to library school, which I did after I went to, to um, graduate school in writing. 
but certainly everything changed being in Alan's class. I think I could have passed through graduate school and drifted off and not continued to write, but he really was very convincing on the subject of how lucky we were. Yeah, I, I, I can't imagine how my life would have been different if it hadn't been for Alan. Like I'm, I may have gotten here, but the road would have been completely different. And I may not have gotten here because to have someone who believed in me so much, although it wasn't me, he believed in all of us so much. It wasn't like I, he picked me out as the star of the class. He was just that person for all of us. Reading the, um some of the comments that you had, uh, some of the comments that he, that he had written um, in some of your assignments and writing um, in the book was just, um, I just thought, wow, what, what a wonderful man, you know, to be so encouraging and uh, what a secure and good human to, to be so uh, helpful. And then, you know, each draft after draft got, you know, he, he was there with you. He was. He wanted to know why. Why is that person on the on the porch? Had that. Let me see that person on the person on the porch. It was great. It's just like, well, he's not tearing you down, boy. And I just thought it was lovely that you included that in the book. Lainey, do we have more he's, questions? He's also an astonishing writer, and I think oh, this is true. This is true for for Anne. He embodied being a writer. I mean, he was just so not only generous but so devoted to his own extraordinary work. And he has a book that came out at the beginning of this year, The Uncollected Stories of Alan Gorganis, which is amazing. And he- he, so glamorous. he was glamorous and sexy and beautifully dressed. And, you know, he was having this life and, and it was like, yeah, I wanna sign up for all of it, not just the job because he made the job look so hot. It's absolutely true. Yeah. I ah, love it. Love that. Okay, Lainey Moore. Well, lots of people want to know what both of you are reading right now. What is what's on? What's a favorite or one that you have on the list? <laughs> so, I just finished Elizabeth McCracken's new novel yesterday afternoon, which I read in manuscript, and I I, I was vibrating all day. It's so fantastic. So we really, really have something to look forward to. Um, my God, it is so good. And, and again, like, you know, what you were saying, it gets a little wearying to say, oh, I think I like this better than anything you've ever written. But I think I like this better than anything you've ever written because not only is it beautiful and moving, but what you're doing with form, what you're taking on intellectually and emotionally and artistically is, so astonishing. And when I got into bed last night, I brought three galleys and I would open one up and read 10 pages and think, well, this isn't Elizabeth McCracken's new book. And I would throw it on the floor and I would open the other one. So yeah, that's what I'm reading. What about you? You're nice. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think of the, the, I'm about to read Whereabouts, which I haven't read yet and I'm looking forward to. I know we're both huge fans of the newest Sally Solomon book, which is coming out in October. October, Days of Africa. October 9th, I'm not sure. Days of Africa. Yeah, uh, like that, that is a book that I'm just so looking forward to. Yeah, you know, I got, um, I got an email from Hudson, Hudson newsstands, Hudson booksellers, you know, the people in the airport and the train station. Um, and they were putting together their list of the 10 best books of the year and getting people to recommend a book. And that was my pick. I mean, I really sat down and thought, what was the book that I loved? And so much of it is what sticks. Do you find that? Yeah. Elizabeth and I both read so much that's new, like way, way outside the curve. Well, of course we're speaking to a bunch of librarians. So you're also chin deep in galleys, I'm sure. And I can read a galley and really love it. And then by the time it comes out four or five months later, I pick it up and I think, what? I didn't read this. I mean, like, it, the way that some books just, even if I enjoy them, they 
all completely out of my consciousness. And that was a book, Days of Africa was a book that grew and grew. I love it more and more. It takes up more space. It's a very short book. It takes up more space in my heart as the months go by. And I'm, I'm terrified that it won't catch, you know? So it's a book that we have to all really be aware of um, in part because it's FSG and in part because it doesn't have a great cover. And, and I'm so afraid, I, I mean, I just, I just say that as a bookseller, I'm so afraid that people might miss it. So please make a note of that book and make sure you get it into people's hands. It's funny, it's moving, it's- Sexy. Sexy, it's layered. I feel like that's one of the things that I, it was just, I, I watch a lot of Penn and Teller fool us. They're, they're magic clips of um, magicians doing tricks for Penn and Teller and Penn and Teller is supposed to figure out how it's done and if they can't figure it out. And it's this, it's this amazing show that's about skill and admiration because they love it when they get fooled and they love it when they figure it out. And they, I just watched a clip this morning as it happens um, in which somebody does a trick and Penn and Teller, well, let's face it, Penn, translating for Teller says, we not only couldn't figure out how you did the trick, we couldn't figure out the plot of the trick ahead of time. And that's sort of how I feel about that book. It's like, I didn't know how that book was going to unfold and also how she fits different times into, into, into one plot line. And you're making me think of a line again, it's a galley. I didn't, I didn't highlight a book, but um, in the essay, I talked to the Association of Graduate School Deans, where you're talking about, you had no idea that owning a bookstore was gonna be one of your career options. Um, and you say, uh, I promote the books I love tirelessly because a book can so easily get lost in the mad shuffle of the world and it needs someone with a loud voice to hold it up and praise it. I am that person. And I love, I love that line. Um, and that is who you are. You've always been such a great champion of books. You've come to the Public Library Association, the American Library Association, telling people not about your books, but about other people's books. And so just as evidenced by right now, the conversation you and Elizabeth are having, it's not published by HarperCollins. So what? It's great. Get it out there. I love that. Well, and, and also, I mean, Elizabeth and I, for our really long, deep, wide friendship, that is another place that we meet. Because Elizabeth is one of the few people that reads as much fiction before publication as I do. And so often if I say to her, oh my God, I read this a Sally Solomon book. And she's like, oh yeah, she's my student. <laughs> I think there's nothing, I can't surprise her. It's like Penn and Teller, right? I can't <laughs> surprise her. No matter what book I come up with, she's already read it. And she's very good at feeding me suggestions. You, you fed me Sweetness of Water. Nathan Harris, which I fed to someone else. And <laughs> good things happened in <laughs> Harris. Yeah. Uh, and and that's, that's just the way it is. Like either you're a generous reader or you're a jerk, really. There's yeah. just nothing, nothing else to be said. 100%. Oh my God, this, this, we can go on like this forever. This is just such a lovely conversation. Um, there, one, wait, Sorrow and Bliss, Meg May. I love that book. I love that book so passionately. I was at the bookstore this morning. I sold two copies of Sorrow and Bliss this morning before I left. Um, and that is a book that I feel like did not have the right cover and looks like a piece of chiclet. And it is not, it is such a good book. And that's another one that I keep shouting at. Boy, books with bad covers just break my heart because you're doomed if you've got a bad cover. 
Well, first of all, thank you for saying that. And it's true. And that is one of our books. And we can put the link up to that book in the chat room so that people can check that out if they've not yet. And speaking of covers, before we go, which I don't want to do, um, and we're not limited to three o'clock on the dot, by the by, but um, I would love, Anne, if you would show us the final jacket oh, yeah. of, of um, these precious days. And can you tell us a little bit about the story? Yeah, I'm gonna yeah. show you the, the one that we didn't pick. So um, my editor, Jonathan Burnham, and the wonderful director of the art department at Harper, Robin Biardello, and I worked with both of them for years. And man, do I have opinions about jackets. I have the giant painting of the jacket of the Dutch house in the room with me. So Sookie was in all the meetings and we couldn't decide if we wanted the painting of the woodpecker or the painting of my dog Sparky. And we kept going back and forth. Robin was mocking them both up. And then I came up with the idea that we would have a book with two covers, not publish a book with multiple covers, but basically the, it has a, two fronts on it. And we picked these colors from a million different choices and they printed this up and we lived with it for a while. And then Suki said to me, I just don't like the colors. They seem really muddy. Like they're not sitting well over time. And I said, okay, you pick exactly the colors you want. And she picked these colors and she was, you know, sending the Pantone numbers to make sure that they got the exact right red and the exact right pink. And they look so hot and so crazy together. And then just, God, we had conversations about should the type come right up to the line, to the top and the bottom? Should we move it down a little bit? And, and I always say, this is what a Sarah Lawrence education will do for you. This is what a good liberal arts education will do. I can sit around and talk about covers and colors and typeface forever. And honestly, more people should, but it yeah. makes me so happy to know that not only are there two Suki Raphael paintings on the cover of this book, but that she picked the colors um, she was involved in the conversations about the spine and the typeface and that Harper Collins was just so great, so great because I, I can't think that the world is full of publishers who are like, yeah, we really want to get on a Zoom call week after week after week with your friend and make sure that we're doing this exactly right. But they kept printing up different versions and sending them to her and she saw this cover before she died and she loved it so much. And be sure to look up her paintings, um, Suki Raphael, and they're there from the Rose Gallery. She had a beautiful show about 10 days before she died, which was magic, amazing to see it all together. Well, I, I have to say, I, I, I did, uh, go down that uh, rabbit hole. It's not a rabbit hole. It's a beautiful display of her creations and those colors really are, uh, they just wrap you up, you know? Yeah. They're, they're just gorgeous. And and I and speaking of the whole, and I love that she got to, to see it at the end. I just, I can't imagine how wonderful that must've been for both of you. I, I also love your essay in the book about covers and and what goes into them and, you know, the international covers and like, what's that? You know, I mean, it's, it's just a very interesting aspect of publishing and when you, um, but this is so poignant and beautiful. And I just, I just, uh, I'm so happy to, uh, that you can, you know, tell the story about the period at the end of this particular sentence um, and that she played such a, a role in it. And it was wonderful, really wonderful. Thank you. Yes. Um, I don't know if we have more questions. I do want to read two quick quotes for both of your books, please. So going back to the Souvenir Museum, as I did mention before, yeah, paperback, and then of course there's the, the tease that Anne just made for the, new, the next novel. Um, Published by a division of HarperCollins. <laughs> a division of HarperCollins. Who are they? 
but Publishers Weekly, uh, I, I love this. Um, I love this quote. Is Star Review, Star Review from Kirkus. So much love for this book. Um, at the uh, But McCracken Sly Emotionally Complex Collection after Bolloway focuses on a characters uprooted from their usual surroundings. Each story opens to reveal a whole life spent within the web of a family, chosen or not. Full of gems, this collection is a winner. It is absolutely beautiful. And we have spent um, this hour speaking about this forthcoming book, but I certainly don't want to uh, just remind people again of this fabulous collection of, of, um, of stories here, the Souvenir Museum. I just, it's just so wonderful. And the praise came rolling in as of course it would. There it is. Thank you, Lainey. Um, it's just, it's just, uh, just a terrific collection. You go up and you go down and, and uh, they're funny. And there, and I love how you said, Elizabeth, in one interview, that while um, most of these most of these people are not not based on people you know, but the anecdotes are. I think that's pretty much what you had said. Hey, and, um, Elizabeth, is hmm? that actually a Jeff Coons? No, I don't. I think it's an actual balloon dog. Okay, thanks. <laughs> thanks very much for clarifying. You're welcome. <laughs> Uh, and we had um, Elizabeth on door to door. So I put that link in there for everybody to go back and hear our full interview. That was a terrific interview. And just, um, and that was um, on January 7th, which was right after the insurrection. And boy, did we need to uh, pause still on that for a second and hear about this book, hear about these stories, hear, hear about these, these, characters were interwoven through I think five of the stories within the collection and it's just it's just a beautiful it's a beautiful collection of stories and um, that's a wonderful interview so for anyone who hadn't seen that please do go back and see it and the paperback will be out in January and these precious days two starred reviews here um, Publishers Weekly and Kirkus Review and PW says the elegance of Patchett's prose is seductive and inviting with Patchett as a guide Readers will really get to grips with the power of struggles, failures, and triumphs alike. Couldn't say that better. And that's exactly what this book is. Um, and it's a, it's a, it's a tribute. It's about life. It's about staying in the moment. Um, it's about being appreciative of the days, the days that we have, the days that we have, hopefully the days that we will have. I thank you both so much for coming on today. Um, and. Um, we uh, please go to the to the to the links to check out the books that we a couple of the books we've mentioned here. And by the way, there are so many books that are mentioned in this book. There's like there's like a little a readers advisory it should be at the back of this book, and because there's so much about Eudora Welty. Go ahead, you go. Anne. Okay, okay, but let me tell you, in November, two weeks before this book comes out, Louise Erdrich's book, The Sentence, comes out. Oh my God, I love this book so much. And you want to talk about a book with book recommendations. There are pages and pages in the back. I mean, not only are there books all through the book, but then at the end, she's just like, here, these are all the books you need to read. And uh, what a gift that is. I love that book so much. The Sentence. The Sentence. Just ask Lainey to put the link in the chats to Louise Erdrich's book, The Sentence. So that'll be in there as well. Um, and um, I think unless there's anything that we've missed, I know, Lainey, we just want to briefly talk about the Instagram takeover next week. And Elizabeth, you can hang on one second. Um, Lainey, just remind folks, and then we will say our goodbyes. Yeah, a little commercial break. Sorry. Um, just a <laughs> quick reminder Thursday, we're switching it up a bit because I think Friday's uh, summer is ending and Fridays are a little busy for everyone. So we're going to do Thursdays for our Instagram takeover. We have Dr. Sean Tesson. Um, very uh, cool thing that we're having. He has a great Instagram account. He is called America's Holistic Gynecologist and he's just there to help people and give a lot of information. And he loves questions and he loves answering them and he has like TikTok videos. He's very funny. So please join all day on Thursday, Harper Library, and you can hear from Dr. Tesson. Yeah, I think that's important. And I think if we had said goodbye before we did our um, 
mention of that, then folks would miss out on what is surely going to be uh, um, an enlightening and engaging um, afternoon. So it's important stuff. And so more important stuff, the Souvenir Museum by Elizabeth McCracken, These Precious Days by Ann Patchett, um, going on sale in November 2021. Maybe if you want to show the jackets one more time. And um, be well, Ann, Elizabeth, Thank you so much for all that you've done and continue to do for readers, for writers, and for wonderful souls like, like Sookie Raphael. Mm, thank, you. thank you. Thanks for doing this, Elizabeth, especially you, since Virginia and Laney had to do it, but you did. <laughs> oh, it's been a dream. I love the book so much. Thank you. And I love you so much. So, you so much. Look at that. There you go. <laughs> All right, thank well, you. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks for watching. See you next week.